Um, I'm actually an Endeavor entrepreneur myself, and um, I joined from a couple of months ago. And uh, the topic of today is uh, pretty much what I've been doing for 10 years. Um, I am the CEO and founder of IST Networks, and um, we work in uh, making businesses serve their customers better through uh, offering IT solutions. Um, that being said, um, one of the good things about Endeavor is um, it allows you to uh, have access to a big network, this big network of global and local entrepreneurs and mentors. The um, Endeavor Egypt has 70 mentors and 22 entrepreneurs, uh, and this is its third year for uh, to be part of Rise Up. That being said, I would like to kick off our sector overview with uh, Amir Tanes. Thank you. Thank you, Ham. So before I start, let me just tell you briefly what we do. What we do as Nielsen or what we do as researchers. What we do is that we meet with a lot of consumers and we speak to them and we get to know their uh, points of view and their usage and their attitudes, their behavior and so on. And using this data that we gather, we come up with some trends and then we're able to observe these trends and accordingly help clients, help entrepreneurs and help uh, even maybe students to get to cope up with these trends and act accordingly. So what are we speaking about today briefly? First of all, we're speaking about the trends, the facts and the figures. So what is the market doing today in terms of digital and IT? And then what we're, what we're going to, to see is some success stories. So what have some companies did to cope with the digital and to cope with this IT and mobile technology? Last but not least, some key takeaways that we're taking back, uh, I'll leave with you. So, TV, right? I'm sure you all remember TV, and you all uh, spend some time on TV, but how long do you spend on TV compared to 10 years back? Is it more or less? Much less, right? So TV is more or less declining, and then it's internet, right? So internet started off with a cable, and people were using mobile phones at uh, uh, internet at home. But then they were not happy. Why? Because they want on the go. So uh, internet service providers started taking it one step further. So what did they do? They had this mobile USB. So you go out, you go to a cafe, you use internet, but you have to take your laptop and you have to take your USB, right? But then again, people were not happy. It's on the go, but it requires laptop and so the device manufacturers started giving smartphones, so people can use their smartphone everywhere, right? And access the internet. And then the next level was, the next level was tablets. So for the sake of a bigger screen, on the go, people are now using tablets. Multiple screens have been there. If it was TV only 10 years back, today the game has totally changed. Creating what we call screens war. So today the screens are actually fighting. Why? Because every screen wants the consumer to, give pay, to pay more attention to them only. What is the uh, key thing that all the consumers do online? Social media. I'm sure you agree to that. Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Instagram, Skype, and so on, right? So going to the facts and figures, in 2012 in Egypt, among internet users, shared ADSL was 60%. So anyone that uses uh, internet, 60% of these, we're using shared ADSL. What is shared ADSL? It's basically having a connection that I share with my neighbors, right? So how is it today? In 2015, trends have totally changed. So shared ADSL is declining. Even dedicated ADSL has declined. Mobile USB, which was very convenient a couple of years back, has also declined. But what is increasing? It is the mobile internet. So 77% of internet users today access internet through their mobile phone, which is a great figure, 77%. What else? On average, internet users spend 20 hours a week online. <clears throat> and the percentage of very heavy users, which is 14 hours plus, is 42%. So on average, uh, 20 hours is around three, uh, three hours a day, which is a very uh, long time duration. What about the older age groups? It's 21 hours a week, which is still on the higher side. The surprising thing is that for those 
older than 55 years, 45% of these started accessing internet in the last year. And this is why I'm sure most of you are getting Facebook friend requests from your parents, right? And your parents' friends, and actually your grandparents and your grandparents' friends, and I'm sure you're annoyed sometimes. So, a couple of decades back, this is how every family was gathering around TV. How did it change? The multiple screens, again back to the problem, screens war. Things have changed so much. Every person in the family is using, is using the screen that appeals to them. Now, what is happening on TV? Back to TV. 73% of those uh, watching TV say that they switch to another TV channel when a commercial advertisement comes on. What, did, what does this tell me? If I spend $100 on TV, I'm only left with $27. And then being very optimistic, of the 27 uh, people remaining on this channel where, I'm, where my TV ad is aired, I'll say 50% is my target group. So out of actually every $100 I spend on TV, I'm only left with somewhere between 15 to $20 where it has reached my right target. So is it as uh, effective as it always used to be? Not so sure. What else? 64% say that uh, they watch several uh, uh, video episodes on the same day when they go back home. So I'm at work, I'm busy all day, I go back home, I watch two or three uh, episode, episodes of, of, of my uh, favorite program or series. This is where YouTube comes in, this is where Netflix comes in, and so on and so forth. <coughs> uh, last but not least, 61% say that watching a, a program on, on their uh, mobile device is extremely convenient. And this is where mobile phone uh, uh, manufacturers have started taking it to the next level. So they know that you need to uh, uh, watch your, your, your videos on, on your phone, and then this is where today we can see bigger screens, and looking back, we had keypads, we had all, uh, all the space consumed, but today it's only the screen. So number one, what are the facts and figures saying? They're <coughs> only confirming that we have a screens war. Screens war, screens and fighting for the sake of the attention of the consumer. Now going to the success stories. We know the fact, we know the trend. <coughs> Sorry. But how can we use this uh, data that we have in our favor? How can we make consumers pay attention to us? So, for radio, it took 38 years to reach 50 million users. TV took 13 years to reach 50 million users. Wow, Facebook took 3.5 years to reach 50 million users. Do you think it can get any faster? Okay, guess what? It took Candy Crush 50 days to reach 50 million users, which means, on average, a million new gamers every day. Why? Because I'm sure at some point in time, you are getting a hell of uh, Candy Crush uh, invites on your Facebook, right? It's about the share. It's about being shareable. So once you start sharing, the content goes faster and faster, and it actually goes viral. So uh, once it goes viral, so I share something today. Friends share it tomorrow. Friends of friends shared the day after. And then by end of the week, I find everyone discussing what I shared one week back. So this is the power of, the power of being viral, the power of going digital. Oscar's selfie. The celebrities took one uh, a photo using their Samsung phone. And then Samsung used this photo and they posted it online. What happened? In first 45 minutes, 1.3 million retweets. In two days, 3 million retweets. And today it's seen by above 37 million people. This is the power of digital. Okay, this is a company called WestJet. Does anyone know about it? WestJet is a Canadian airline company. And in Christmas one year, they decided to do something completely different. What was it? They decided 
instead of giving passengers their luggage, they'll give them Christmas gifts. So some people get uh, LCD screens, some people get iPhones, some people get different PlayStation or whatever. And then they decided to post this video on YouTube. So today, this video has above 35 million YouTube views, and it has, it has generated 42.2 twi uh, million Twitter impressions, uh, hashtag WestJet Christmas. But the good thing is, it's not only stopped there. <coughs> it had a great impact on the business KPIs. So if we only think that digital will increase our brand awareness, yes, it will. It will uh, uh, improve the loyalty or the appeal of consumers to my brand. This is all great. But eventually, it will have a very positive uh, 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 outcome on my business KPIs, on my net revenue. So uh, when, they, when, they, when they checked their revenues compared to the previous year, it was 86% higher. That's great. Definitely great. So what are the key takeaways before I leave you? Digital media is about, what's the magic word? Sharing. So once it gets shared, the content spreads faster. Eventually what happens is, the impact rises significantly. Right? Last thing I'll leave you with is that we do not have uh, an, an option or a choice whether we do social media today or not. What, we, uh, what the question we need to ask, our, ask ourselves is how well we do it. So whatever my business is, whatever uh, industry I'm working in, it has to be extremely uh, revolving around digital. So be it an Uber, it's through your phone. Uh, you want to book a doctor? Today there was a, a, in, in the morning industry spotlight, it was about uh, booking your doctor through uh, a mobile app and a, a, a website. Uh, whatever, name it, whatever industry you're, you're working in, it has to revolve around digital. It has to be very convenient to the consumer. As we've seen, it's on the go. People want everything to be on their phone. So whatever industry, again, you're operating in, always remember, go digital and revolve around the phone of the consumer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Um, now we'll be doing the Cairo Tech Mac. Tech tech map done by uh, Endeavor Egypt. Hiba Gamel will be uh, presenting the Cairo tech map. How are you guys? Good? Okay, sorry, I'm gonna need some help. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm not going to take a lot of your time. I'm going to be very quick. Um, we thought it would be extremely relevant to share with you um, a research that we did uh, earlier this year. Uh, but before I get into that, let me quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Heba Gamel, and I work uh, with an organization called Endeavor, uh, which you may have heard about because you're here. Um, and Endeavor is, a, is an organization that supports high-impact entrepreneurs. And um, we're very, very interested in ecosystems. Uh, so we thought of um, wanting to explore the idea of what does it mean to have a very uh, vibrant ecosystem um, within, uh, within a city? Uh, so we focused on the tech sector in Cairo, and we looked at it uh, over time uh, just to explore some ideas around what the role of influencing entrepreneurs is. Um. It's always the tech panels that have the most technically challenged. Uh... Oh, there we go. So how, have any of you heard of a company called IT Works? Can I see a show of hands? Amazing. Um, so for the ones that haven't raised their hands, IT Works is a, um, is a technology company, um, an Egyptian technology company that was started by a group of friends and it has the typical uh, tech uh, entrepreneurial story. It started out in a small room and it grew into a huge organization um, uh, back in 1994 and it currently has over um, uh, 
850 people. Uh, it's a huge, huge company. Um, it, when, you, when we think today, especially at Rise Up, uh, about the entrepreneurship ecosystem, you, you kind of think of what's happening now, right? Rooms full of people, people know what the word entrepreneurship is, we're having discussions about it. But can you imagine what it was like in 1994? Um, I will show you. So just to give you a quick overview of what we're talking about here is um, we're looking at entrepreneurs that influence other entrepreneurs. Um, what does that mean? Entrepreneurs can play many, many roles. They can mentor other entrepreneurs. They can invest in other entrepreneurs. Um, they can co-found other companies, so they're serial entrepreneurs themselves. Um, they can go on and build an organization that breeds entrepreneurship, so um, an entire organization that thinks very entrepreneurially, so people are constantly leaving that organization and becoming entrepreneurs themselves. So these, these are the things that we actually looked at. Um, so we decided to look at the ecosystem, all of it, uh, the technology ecosystem, and look at those uh, five things and see what is happening, who is influencing whom in, in that ecosystem. So we looked at mentorship, inspiration, um, investment, uh, employment and founding other companies. So these were all the connections that we are looking for. So we surveyed over uh, 300 tech uh, entrepreneurs. I wonder if any here, anyone here actually took that survey? No tech entrepreneurs? Okay. Well, we, we did it in Cairo and we looked at the entire, uh, entire sector and we asked every single entrepreneur those five questions. Who mentored you? Who invested in you? Have you mentored in anyone? Have you invested in anyone? Um, have any of your employees left and started their own organization, their own venture? Um, and we tracked all of these things. So let me walk you through what we found out. So what you're looking at, and I apologize, it's tiny, it's meant to be tiny. Um, you're looking at the entrepreneurship ecosystem. This is a snapshot of the technology entrepreneurship ecosystem in the 90s here in Cairo. Um, as you can see, there were very, very few companies, um, just a little over 20 or so. Um, and the size of those, bu of those bubbles is the size or is, or is equal to the influence that each of those founders that founded those companies had on the rest of the ecosystem. And each concentric circle represents a decade or a snippet of time. So the lines between those companies represent, um, represent those connections. So these are entrepreneurs that said, yes, I was mentored by X. Yes, I invested in X. Yes, I was inspired by X. So those are different colored, um, different colored uh, lines and different colored connections, meaning different things between one entrepreneur and another. So as we go on in time, uh, you see that more companies come on, on the ecosystem. So more companies are getting started, more things are happening, and the bubbles of some of these companies are getting bigger. The more we move forward in time, you see the same thing repeating over and over again. And over and over again. So what does this tell you? So there are, we, we, we focused on three particular companies here, and I'm guessing most of you have again heard of these companies. So there's IT Works, as you can see. Um, there's Link and CitySoft. So three huge technology companies that started um, in very different fields, doing very different things, um, but had a lot of influence on the rest of the ecosystem. So the founders of those companies basically took their knowledge, their success, their failures, and started investing that in the next generation of entrepreneurs. Um, so just a quick, quick roundabout on, on what, uh, what's happening in the, in the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Egypt. So as we look at the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Egypt, you see that 90% male, 10% uh, female, so nothing shocking there, but um, I think that's changing a lot. We have a lot of fantastic um, uh, female entrepreneurs that are in the tech space. Um, interesting stats here as well. So 64% of those have attended a private high school versus 34% attending a public high school. Um, these are some of the universities that most of these entrepreneurs that we surveyed, uh, AUCNs I think are very happy seeing the slide. Um, 
but, but this is what I think is most interesting and something that speaks very um, uh, true to, to our core mission at Endeavor, which is the actual, um, a, which is how fast these companies can grow and what kind of influence they can have on our economy as a whole and how many jobs they can create. So something that we looked at is actually looking at the, on, at the, at the compounded annual growth rate of these tech companies, and it's 33%, which is a very healthy growth rate um, for, the entrepreneurs, for the technology uh, sector. I'm going to skip through a few of the next slides, um, but I want to show you just one really interesting slide, which is comparing our technology um, uh, ecosystem or, or yeah, entrepreneurship ecosystem to that of New York. And the one that thing that I think is most shocking, so most things are quite comparable, but the one thing that is most shocking is investment. Um, so this is maybe a call to a lot of entrepreneurs to start thinking about, you know, what, what will they do when they get to a point where they have their own success um, and in, in terms of wealth and will they invest that in the next generation of entrepreneurs. So I'll leave you at that and I'll hand it over back to Fahmi so that you can start the panel. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Heba. If we could start the panel, please, if the panelists would come up. Uh, if you could please start by uh, introducing yourselves, please. Okay, um, uh, my name is Tamer Larabi. I'm the managing director for Nielsen for North Africa and Levant. Uh, very pleased to be here. Uh, and, uh, hopefully, I can be adding some value to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Khalil Shadid. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, ReserveOut.com. Always happy to, uh, to join Endeavor events uh, in Egypt and other places. Hello, uh, this is Elir Zawa Bolan from Turkey, Istanbul. Uh, I am an angel investor in BIC, which is a German fund in Turkey. I have five investments so far, and one is here as a sponsor, RECMO. I am Chris Rogers from Lumia Capital. We are a San Francisco-based but global investing um, VC fund. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Um, Chris, if you could please start by um, what are the latest innovations and tech trends that are you seeing uh, in the tech space in general? You have, uh, let's say, a, a big overview given your uh, uh, experience. Advanced stage, yeah, yes. is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Um, number one, I would like to know, I can barely see you because there are two incredibly blinding lights right in our eyes. But it's okay, you can leave the lights. I'm just curious, is this an audience really of entrepreneurs or people who want to be entrepreneurs? If you are an entrepreneur, raise your hand. That's not as many as I thought. Oh, now a few more are going up. Uh, is anybody here an investor? Only a few. Okay, well, I'm going to go from the entrepreneurial perspective then because I've had a lot of people come up and... Um, <clears throat> pitch me today, which happens a lot when you're a venture capitalist, and so I think from, from what you're saying, it's going to be through the filter of an investor talking to entrepreneurs, yes. and everybody is talking about a couple of the key trends, and that really let's talk about um, big data for a moment, because when we look at that phenomenon, and, and the phenomenon that, that that is big data, is tied with the cloud phenomenon, is tied with the mobile phenomenon, it all means that the expectations for the entrepreneur are much, much higher. It means to me that every business can be run on data. There's no room for feelings and words like huge and big and important. It's like 100%, 90%, 22 million, whatever it is, it's data-driven, numeric, because there's no reason not to be capturing all the data that's available and computing it because it's all available to you and it's available cheap and easy because of the cloud and in your hands because of the prolifer proliferation of mobile devices. And, and so again, I'm, I'm going to focus on what I expect from the entrepreneurs, but, but 
So hopefully that, that gives you some answers. Thank you. Um, back to big data. All right. Uh, you've worked in Ali, you've worked in SAP, Microsoft, IBM. Yeah. And there's a lot of um, Technology th these companies. technologies invest and focus on big data. And you have also a lot of experience when it comes to big data. So could yeah. you give us um, some light on that aspect, please? Sure, yeah. Uh, this is a good point because I both worked in... Uh, I'm a computer engineer by degree, uh, by, uh, for uh, instance. And I worked in the, those companies in technology department. And uh, after becoming an engineering master, there are lots of... Because entrepreneurs are early adopters. If there is a topic like big data, IoT, mobile, etc., they are all starts to working on it. And they come with different ideas about big data. And in Turkey and in Europe, when I look to the big data kind of uh, ideas, startups, etc., they are all trying to work with a lot of data. They, because when you say big data, they understand a lot of data. And this is a problem, because big data is in SAP, in Oracle, in uh, IBM. They try to get, a, a, how can I say, predictive decisions on uh, executing data. It is not just storing data and making it a lot of data and doing, the, trying to do something. But I saw that uh, lots of the entrepreneurs are getting lost in this data loop because big data is a topic, as its name, it's a really big topic. And uh, for this, you need to have your own unique solutions. For example, SAP has HANA. Oracle has Exadata and Exalytics. There, there are all 100,000 K dollars uh, solutions. And an entrepreneur comes with a simple idea. I am not talking about the idea, but they all think that big data is a hot topic. And if I store all the data, I am a big data company. So it is not like this. You all need to execute and you need to understand this data. And otherwise, you are just, I don't know, getting lost in this data uh, for big data side. Thank you. Um, technology no longer a tool but a driving force. Khalil, you are the CEO and founder of uh, Reserve Al, okay? And how are you using technology to um, drive the business, drive the business growth? Um, so we, we come, I mean, our industry is one that uh, decided to start adopting technology, maybe for the lack of technology, really late. I mean, if you think about restaurants up until maybe 10 years ago, there wasn't really much technology involved in restaurants. And that's one of the, you know, one of the solutions that we brought to market is when we looked at, at restaurants all over the world, I mean, I was living in New York at the time when, when uh, Reserve Out as an idea came, came up, but implemented it here in the Middle East. Um, you cannot run a business without technology, right? It is a driving force. Initially, maybe a lot of it was tools to help you do things better, but in today's world, going back to the topic of big data and being able to identify you know, all of the, the, the points that you need to know to enhance the operation and to make sure your business runs the way it should. Um, and and making it, maybe giving you an example of that, when we were talking to restaurants five years ago before we launched, and we would ask them, well, you know, who are your top spenders? And they wouldn't know. They said, well, we know our regulars. They come a lot. But, but that's not what I asked. I asked, who is you know, your top spender? Who spends the most money in any given month? And they didn't know that because everything was on a pen and paper. Maybe if they were a bit advanced, they used an Excel sheet. But there was no system that allowed them to really press a button and find that information. And that's what we came and did. We, we provided them with a solution that, that enables them to manage all their reservations, that gave them a, a client relationship management system day one. And even if I went to a restaurant once a month and I happened to spend $10,000 on that month, I will be their top client and they will know who I am, even if I just come to, let's say, in, in Egypt once a year, right? So using data and being able to, to present it in a way that makes every single person part of the operation able to understand it and act upon it makes it a big driving force in the industry that we're in today and in many other industries as well. So where are you going to dinner tonight? Just so I'll I tell know. you later. <laughs> <laughs> well, Khalil is expanding to Egypt soon, right? Yes. So Hopefully in the next two to three months, you'll find uh, Egypt, Cairo specifically to start uh, on reserveout.com. Um, consumer behavior changing technology or technology changing consumer behavior? That's a question to Tamil Arabi. Um, it's a big question, and I, I think it does relate to uh, whatever we said before, especially on the big data front. It's, uh, I think, also working for within the telecommunication industry and looking at big data, uh, there is a big question mark on, 
okay, how do we use this data and what does it mean? And I think the devil lies in consumer understanding. It's all about finding the correct moments that actually uh, shapes up uh, uh, consumer behavior and actually identifying the appropriate proposition on that front. So there is so, so much need that is not deciphered yet because we are probably driven by technology. But what we need to find is the true moment that where technology and true consumer understanding come together. And that will help us deliver bigger you know, clusters of data that will serve particular propositions or serve particular needs and subsequently also will give us the chance to understand the, a good roadmap of what we need to build. It will be a, a, a better fine-tuned image of how we can become more efficient when it comes to entrepreneur and addressing these needs. And subsequently, it would also create a better, uh, you know, uh, an improved uh, uh, life, life, uh, uh, lifestyle for the consumers. <coughs> I think this is the trick. This is not, not a lot of work has been done on that front. Um, and I think this is where uh, we can come to a good understanding of where to invest and what is the true need in the market. I think if, um, uh, what you say is very interesting, and it also ties to something Ali said also, which is you know storing data doesn't make you a big data company, right? But, but knowing your business and understanding what is the data I need to focus on and what is the data that will help me drive more sales and increase revenue, it, it will become or should be the one that you're focusing on and, and identifying. And if that's something that you could do on your own or seek outside help, it's very important to know what these metrics are and what data you should be collecting and executing on. But I think there's also an interesting intersection in what you said and, and the regulatory trend because if it doesn't if the consumer is not perceiving it as a better experience or advantageous to them, you're going to see the forces um, pushing for data privacy in a more restrictive Absolutely. way winning. Yeah. And it really means that the consumer has to be on board with it. And, and obviously the trends are that the younger the consumer, the more on board they are. But that's in part because they're using it and they're getting the benefit of the experience. I completely subscribe to that. And I know in Europe and the Western world there are far more restrictions right now because of the privacy acts and so on and so forth. And I think the opportunity in, that, in, in our part of the world right now, with this thing's eventually going to develop, but it's not the case, is to, have, to be able to capitalize on this information, the right storage data or the right behavioral, the right attitudinal data that could be collected through companies like us. But the proliferation of this data, the understanding of it, and actually building up the right, you know, uh, applications to support support the, the, the needs co uh, coming out of that is what needs to happen. I think entrepreneurs need very much to focus on finding the right, correct need, the true moments of consumer need that would help them shape up their businesses and make sure they are uh, uh, revenue uh, uh, driven. How about when it comes to IT and mobile technology helping to disrupt existing um, industries where you have big players typically playing in it? Uh, what would you be your um, take on that aspect? You're looking at me? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, obviously, I have a, a mobile background. I've been in the business um, since <clears throat> before most of you. I'm looking around again closely. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody as old as I am here. By the way, what's the matter with uh, Facebooking your grandchildren? Whoever made a point about that. <laughs> um, but back to the, the point about um, mobile. I think that when, when we look at businesses, we look... Um, I think maybe the, those slides earlier actually understated the power of having a device and, and what's driven that. But it, it means that the mobile ecosystem is by far globally the most important platform for getting technology to penetrate any market. And whether that starts in, in the most developed markets or in emerging markets, it is, it is a truism now. And so every business has to think that way. The most aggressive, probably when, when, when you come to, the, to regions like this and you're a US VC, you do get a lot of entrepreneurs coming. The next biggest group of people that want to meet us are people with traditional businesses because they are completely afraid. And that can be anything from oil to growing rice to solar to building malls to, to whatever it is. They know that their business is going to be disrupted or severely modified 
by technology. They're probably thinking it may not develop locally, that it's going to be something from somewhere else because typically people, everybody in their own market thinks somebody else in some other market is smarter. And so that's the, that's the second most sort of popular inquiry we, we get. Not can you invest in us, but, but how, what do you see that is going to screw up our car dealership or mess up our mall or wreck our bank? And, and I think that, that um, many big businesses now are acutely aware of it, which means that they're becoming more and more anxious to invest. They probably have learned by now that they're not good um, financial investors, but they can be okay strategic investors, and they may even be buying businesses. And I think that that's great for these ecosystems because they know they can't build it themselves. They're, they're more and more clear about that. The biggest and best haven't been able to build it themselves, so the second tier definitely won't. And so when we look for businesses, we look for exactly that, something that is going to be disruptive. I can't think of a business that cannot be, uh, I don't know, cemeteries, maybe there are a few that are going to have trouble with technology, but, but um, even that, holograms might be nice, something could be cool. Uh, virtual reality, augmented reality might make all that a lot nicer. Um, but but I, I think we, we always look for what industries can be disruptive when we make our investment decisions. Thank you, Chris. Khalil, um, when it comes to, again, back to being disruptive, founding Reserve Out, and uh, entering into this industry when it comes to the FNB, do you see that what you've been doing is considered disruptive? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, when we, again, when we entered the market, 99.9% uh, .9 of restaurants were using a pen and paper for their reservations. They did, not, they did not have a database of their clients. They didn't know anything about them. Maybe in 2012, they, t they started telling us that, yes, we have a Facebook page and, you know, we have 10,000 likes. And we're like, that's not a, it's not a database. What, you know, how are you communicating with them? What do you know about them? So... We, we certainly did a lot of disruption in the industry. We educated, and it was very difficult because we had to educate a lot of these restaurant owners and managers about what technology can do for them and why it's very important for them to digitize that operation as opposed to keep it in a completely offline, offline manner. And, and a lot of them today, we're doing a lot of case studies with, with some of these uh, restaurants in Jordan and Lebanon and Dubai. And, and we're actually showing them the impact of adopting technology how much it actually brought in more money, what they know about their clients, and how they're able to communicate with them more and more. But can we add just, just one point to that? Please go ahead. That the very interesting slide at the beginning that, that showed the number of years it took a TV or a radio or whatever the product was to reach 50 million, and then it went to Facebook, and then it went to games. What that tells you is that your question is almost outdated because... People like Reserve Out, and I'm not saying they're not innovating, they're great and they're growing, but they're subject to disruption. There are, you have to assume that there are people just as smart as anybody in this room sitting in 20 conference rooms around the world with access to capital figuring out how to disrupt that open table Reserve Out model. And they're figuring out trying how to disrupt the Uber or the Airbnb. So, and, and the, all of these factors that we've talked about, the, the existence of the cloud and the, the facility that that gives everybody, the, the ability to crunch big data, makes the pace at which the next generation of disruption is coming orders of magnitude faster. Uh, it's uh, tough. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. I, I fully agree. I mean, and we're, we're already seeing that. We're seeing a lot of competition pop up with people that are trying to disrupt what we are already doing. And in many cases, we were ahead of them and because we, you know, for me, is you can never get comfortable. You always have to be on your feet and you always have to be looking yeah. ahead because if you There's think no, that no you've ability to someone. be complacent anymore. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Also. Uh, also, in this point, I think I just have a different view, but uh, it ends up in the same point. Uh, for, for example, for mobile, we, when someone says mobile, we all think about mobile phones in our pockets. But when someone says mobile to me, I always thinking about all movable devices like watch, glass, etc. And think about like this: nearly 20 years ago, there is no mobile phone in 
there is nothing about mobile phone. But we use glasses, we use watches for ages. And now it is time that these devices are going to change. Like Apple is doing Apple Watch, they are changing it. Google is doing Google Glass. And when these devices that are normal, daily, stable devices are going to change, I don't know where it ends up. Like maybe they change the clothes that we wear. Uh, and there are some uh, projects I uh, looked uh, about on, on the internet. And it became the age that this mobile, because uh, when someone says mobile, I understand that there is an intersection. There is mobile, there is big data, and there is IoT, this in internet of things. And when it's all these three combined, now these all areas are developing its own ways, but after 10 years, after 12 years, I don't know, or 20 years, this all three big trends are going to intersect in some, somehow, and in that point, there is going to be a really big change happen. Okay, thank you. Um, back to cloud. Okay, you've, as, as I've said, you've worked in SAP and yeah. um, IBM and Microsoft, and they've invested in cloud, okay? Um, how do you see cloud will impact the... Um, the, uh, the shape of technology yeah. and businesses in general. Yeah, cloud, cloud is a, again another trend and it is very, uh, I think, very attractive. Uh, because why? Uh, because it has some dependencies about culture. Because in our culture, I am coming from Turkey and I, I am from this culture, and in our culture we are all about having some problems about sharing our informations, etc. And we are always having some barriers in our mind about this cloud. But we saw that the companies, for example, if it's a company or if it's an individual, etc., using this cloud in a different way in Europe, in uh, United States. And in my each visit I make to Europe and United States, I really believe in this cloud, but it doesn't have so much effect in our country and in this territory so much. Do you, think, do you think because it's the penetration, like um, the penetration the, of cloud uh, yeah. in our area, so Middle East and Turkey? There is also the lots of political issues about, you know, because it is, it, all these technologies are affecting people's life, but if they, the, for example, in Turkey, as a government policy, uh, the cloud is always a bit tricky. They, they are not trust so much because if you start to put your data online, and there are lots of bad examples in the United States and Europe, someone can crack it and access everything. So it's, it has some cultural dependency. <coughs> it is really different. Uh, there is not that much technological involvement has that cultural dependency. So uh, I, I am following clouds in a different way. So I think this is, uh, again, a different topic. I, th I think that goes back to a point uh, Chris made earlier, and, and we were talking about it uh, uh, before the panel, is I think everything w is user-driven, right? So, I mean, what you mentioned is governments will have regulatory around certain things, but if the user really wants something, things totally. will turn around and it will happen. Yeah, totally. Thank you. Um, Internet of Things, Demir. Um, how do you see the t future of Internet of Things uh, in the area of Middle East? Well, well, I think it's, um, to, to a large extent, it's going to be the model that is going to, you know, evolve everywhere. Uh, I don't, uh, I definitely, the specific applications that relate to, if we uh, take the point of culture and, and particular consumer uh, or uh, company uh, needs uh, here, they, they will shape in this fashion. Uh, but generally, again, it, it, it is a trend that is, again, part of the puzzle that we're all looking at, be that that part, or cloud, or mobile. I mean, the, it is the trend is the direction that uh, where, where technology is leading us, but the idea is how do we ensure that we're taking this to the, to the right road? Um, I think it's an ongoing evolution. I think it's going to be an interesting um, journey to look at, uh, but definitely uh, online uh, online applications and capitalizing the internet further is something that it will happen, and the idea is where is it going to take us? I think that's up to entrepreneurs to, uh, to help shape this up and, and show us the direction. I mean, by, by all means, it's true, a true business is going to be built in the future on a true understanding of the technology capabilities and true understanding of the markets and the consumers they look after. Thank you, Tamer. Um, I think uh, time is up right now. And thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.